the fear of the Jews of the small town of Transylvania in Transylvania called Siget, their blindness as they confronted a destiny from which they would have still had time to flee, the inconceivable passivity with which they surrendered to it, deaf to the warnings and pleas of a witness who, having escaped the massacre, relates to them what he had seen with his own eyes. But they refused to believe him and called him a madman. This set of circumstances would surely have sufficed to inspire a book to which I believe no other can be compared. Those words were written by Francois Maurier uh, in the foreword to uh, the famous book by Eli Wiesel uh, called Night. He was, uh, as some of you may know, a, a Holocaust survivor one of the few to enter a concentration camp and live to tell about it. And yet here, the, the original um, publisher who found his book worthy of print describes some of the uh, situations, some of the circumstances surrounding the unfortunate uh, removal of the Jews in this uh, part of the world in Transylvania and just tells a little bit, you can capture from what I read, that this group of Jews in this small town in particular were told of the coming disaster by one who had escaped that destruction and yet they ignored him. They called him a madman and so they eventually would have experienced the same fate and been brought to uh, the concentration camps where so many of them later died. What would those people have given to have that moment again, to hear what they thought at the time were the ravings of a lunatic, and to actually heed those words of potential rescue? They would have given everything they owned to have those moments again. Tonight in Zephaniah chapter 2, we actually encounter a similar word by a prophet who, by those who refused to believe him, would have sounded like a raving lunatic talking about this coming day of the Lord, this coming universal destruction, this awful time on earth where God, the just judge of all the earth, will pour out his unrelenting wrath on evildoers. And here, for the first time from the opening of the book, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, we will encounter the escape from the day of the Lord. This is a fortunate word of hope to any who would heed the prophet's words. Follow along as I read Zephaniah 2, 1 through 3. Gather yourselves together. Yes, gather, O nation, without shame. Before the decree takes effect, the day passes like the chaff. Before the burning anger of Yahweh comes upon you, before the day of Yahweh's anger comes upon you. Seek Yahweh, all you humble of the earth, who have carried out his ordinances. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps, perhaps you will be hidden in the day of Yahweh's anger. This is the small sliver of hope that God, through the prophet Zephaniah, holds out to his rebellious people. And in this passage, really what is revealed is that those who escape the universal destruction of the day of the Lord bear two 
distinguishing marks. This is so simple. Those who escape the universal destruction of the day of the Lord bear two distinguishing marks. And he lays them out. You can see them in the commands that are given. Really, it's broken up into two sections. Verse 1, gather yourselves is the first imperative. And then in verse 3, seek the Lord. This is what is required of those who would escape this coming wrath. Now, we've traversed chapter 1 in a few messages and just seen how awful this day is. Let me just remind you, from the beginning of the book, he just opens talking about a complete removal or a destruction of all things, according to chapter 1, verse 2. All things on the face of the earth declares the Lord. And this is language you'll remember from Genesis 6, what God said to Noah that he would do is destroy all things from the face of the ground. And similar to the flood, this is going to affect these categories of living, living things. Verse 3, man and beast, birds of the sky, fish of the sea, the ruins along with the wicked. In creation and in God's articulation to Noah, he talked about the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the beast of the field, and man. Here, this is the uncreating of those things. So really, the entire world is going to be touched by this judgment. Nothing is going to escape from the wrath, wrath of God. Not things that are on the physical land. Not things that are in the water, like fish and sea creatures. And not even things that could hover between earth and sky, like birds. Wings won't save you. Fins won't help you. Feet won't allow you to run away. There is no escape once this day comes. That's it. And so God talked about in verse 4, stretching out his hand, not only against the whole world, but in particular, Judah, his people. And so this awesome, severe day of the Lord called for silence and sorrow, according to verses 7 and verse 11. So verses 7 through verse 13, silence and sorrow are the appropriate responses to this awful day of the Lord. Anyone who believes these words understands why this is called for. The day is so awesome, so severe, so great, so terrible, it will leave those men and women and children who are here to experience it breathless. The only sounds to be heard are the sounds of lamentation, distress, trouble. And that's further articulated in verses 14 through the end of chapter 1. Just to read that section again, verse 14, near, Zephaniah says, is the great day of the Lord, of Yahweh. Near and coming very quickly. Listen, the day of the Lord. In it, the warrior cries out bitterly. A day of wrath is that day, a day of trouble and distress, a day of destruction and desolation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and the high corner towers. I will bring distress on men so that they will walk like the blind because they have sinned against Yahweh. And their blood will be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to deliver them on the day of Yahweh's wrath. And all the earth will be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he will make a complete end, indeed a terrifying end, of all the inhabitants of the earth. How awful. The same God who is just, in the ways described here, to pour out his completely 
uh, earned, completely justified wrath on mankind is also a God whose scripture reveals, most notably in Exodus 34, who is merciful and gracious. He is slow to anger and he is abounding in steadfast loving kindness toward all those who fear him. He keeps steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. So what would you expect from a God whose character is that expansive, is that broad, just, wrathful, angry at sin, but who also sets his love on saving sinners? to display his mercy, is so eager to be known for his mercy and steadfast love toward undeserving creatures, what would you expect a God who is eager to showcase the panoply of his character, of his attributes, on earth to do? Well, you would expect some sort of rescue from the wrath to come, and that is exactly what we encounter in chapter 2, these first three verses. This is really the hinge on which the entire book of Zephaniah turns. The way to escape the universal destruction detailed in chapter one and to experience what's coming, one day we'll get here soon, in chapter three, by the end of the book, God himself is singing in great joy in the midst of his people as their victorious warrior, savior, king. How do I get there to be with God on that day, dwelling comfortably in his presence and not experience the wrath that's coming? And the answer is found in chapter two. The way you get from chapter 1 into chapter 3 is through chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And so there are two distinguishing marks that are born by all those who will escape what we just read about in chapter 1. If you, man, woman, child here tonight, are going to escape the universal destruction described in chapter one, then you must be characterized, you must be marked by these two distinguishing features that we're going to talk about tonight. And those two features, just very simply, are a right person and right pursuits. A right person and right pursuits. Your life must be marked by uprightness, a right person, And your life must be marked now by right pursuits. And if they are, then you can lay hold of this hope that's given from the prophet so long ago. The day of the Lord is not for you. You will not see that day. If, if on this condition, you are marked by these two features. The first is what I'm calling a right person. This is detailed for us in verses one and two a right person. He says, gather yourselves together. Yes, gather, O nation, without shame. That's verse one. This word gather, it's not used often in scripture. Um, It's only used in three different contexts outside of Zephaniah. So not including Zephaniah, three other times we find this word appearing in just three separate contexts. We're going to look at them tonight. And what you'll see Each time that this word is used, what it's describing really is an orderly uh, collection of something for future use, okay? And so I want to just look at those three other instances. We'll compare and contrast a little bit of those other contexts with this particular use in Zephaniah so that you can hopefully see why what's being described by the prophet here is a right ordering of the life under God's authority. The first usage of this word gather is in Exodus chapter five. Go back to Exodus chapter five. Do you remember what Exodus five is? 
where you are in your Bible in Exodus 5. We've just heard about Moses, uh, this unique story where he's rescued from Pharaoh um, in a really miraculous situation in God's providence. And this Hebrew baby, when all the baby boys are being slaughtered in what later would be very similar to Christ, Christ-like fashion, he's rescued from the ruler of the day who's putting all the Jewish babies to death and ends up being the savior of God's people. In chapter 5, he returns to, to Egypt and he has already confronted Pharaoh with the sin of keeping God's people captive. He is refusing to listen to God's word through Moses and refusing to let the people go. So this invokes some punishment, some retribution from King Pharaoh. Look at Exodus chapter 5, verse 6. So the same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters over the people and their foremen, saying, You are no longer to give the people straw to make bricks as previously. Let them go and gather, that's our word, straw for themselves. But the quota of bricks which they have which they were making previously, you shall impose on them. You are not to reduce any of it, because they are lazy. Therefore they cry out, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let the labor be heavier on the men, and let them work at it so that they will pay no attention to false words. So the taskmasters of the people and their foremen went out and spoke to the people, saying, Thus says Pharaoh, I am not going to give you any straw. You go and get straw for yourselves wherever wherever you can find it. But none of your labor will be reduced. Verse 12, so the people scattered throughout all the land of Egypt to gather, there's our word again, stubble for straw. Pharaoh said, let them go and gather. And so they went and gathered straw or stubble for straw. This is what they did. They went and purposefully, intentionally collected straw to make bricks because they had to meet the quota. Simple, right? The next usage is found in Numbers. Numbers chapter 15. And in this situation, the gathering was actually sinful. It was not just people pursuing meeting uh, some requirements for their labors. But here, God has already articulated uh, the Sabbath for his people. And here is a man sinning in a high-handed way and refuses to heed God's word about keeping the Sabbath holy. Verse 32, Numbers 15 Now, while the sons of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering, there's our word, wood on the Sabbath day. Those who found him gathering, there's the word again, wood brought him to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation. And they put him in custody because it had not been declared what should be done with him or to him. This high-handed sin of gathering on God's holy day uh, warranted the death penalty. It was a capital offense to God. And so this man who is gathering, gathering sticks, uh, doesn't tell us what exactly he's using it for, but this is considered work because work is what was forbidden. And so he is working to collect wood, perhaps to burn or put to to use in some other way uh, soon after he's collected the wood. And so we see that word appear again, gather. He is going about in a thoughtful, intentional way to collect material to put to use in the near future. And then again, the final time before Zephaniah, we encountered this word is in 1 Kings Chapter 17. So fast forward just a few more books to the book of 1 Kings. 
And in chapter 17 of 1 Kings, we have the prophet Elijah during a drought. Because of the sin of the people, this drought was prophesied by Moses long ago in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. This is a part of the curses that came upon the people for their uh, persistent, persistent rebellion against God. And so in verses 10 through 12, we encounter even in this uh, place called Zarephath, which is a Gentile city. It belongs to Sidon. We encounter a widow who is really on her, her last leg. She's got no more food. She's about to collect some things and then go fix a meal so that she can die. Look at verse 8. Then the word of Yahweh came to him, Elijah, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So God is sovereignly going to use a widow to provide for his prophet. Verse 10. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering, there's our word, sticks. And he called to her and said, please get me a little water in a jar that I may drink. As she was going to get it, he called to her and said, please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. I mean, he's asking for water and bread. Those are precious commodities in the midst of a drought. But she's willing she says to him, verse 12, as Yahweh your God lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in the bowl and a little oil in the jar. And behold, I am gathering a few sticks, there's our word again, that I may go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Then Elijah said to her, do not fear, go do as you have said, but make a little break cake from it first and bring it out to me and afterward you may make one for yourself and for your son for thus says Yahweh the God of Israel the bowl of flour shall not be exhausted nor shall the jar of oil be empty until the day that Yahweh sends rain on the face of the earth so God miraculously provides food through his prophet um, she was gathering sticks um, and she says this and repeats what she's doing and so in each of these contexts, you'll know, we encountered that rather rare word how many times? Twice in each context. In each context, the word, the command, some sort of command was given, the story was retold, and it appears twice. So back in Zephaniah, what's Zephaniah doing here? Well, he's actually, I think, borrowing a rare word from other places in scripture, and he even helpfully duplicates the word, and in my opinion, to indicate that he's drawing on this particular usage of the word. Gather yourselves together. Yes, gather. So he uses the same word in close proximity the same amount of times. Now, just to point out a couple things that are unique about this usage, this is the only place, the only context where this is a reference to people, where people are told to gather themselves. So people are being gathered, not other things. Did you notice that it was straw or stubble in Exodus, sticks in Numbers and in First Kings that were being gathered? In both of those contexts, I think it's just interesting to note that those materials in and of themselves were in fact worthless. They're sticks. They're just wood. Unless you're going to do something else with it, it serves no purpose, really. It's stubble. It's straw. Unless you're going to make bricks, something that you can put to use, that in and of itself is pretty worthless. Similarly, in our context, the yourselves, this is told to whom at the end of verse 1. Do you see that? These instructions are given to a nation without shame a shameless nation, a people who are so thoroughly sinful, they don't know how to be ashamed of things that are actually shameful in God's mind. 
they're too worthless. They're told to gather themselves. Just like the other worthless material, you worthless group of sinners, gather yourselves. And again, it's being collected in each of those contexts to be made useful. Now the worthless things are actually useful because of what they're being used for. Bricks, burning a fire, making food, cooking food. So this worthless material can be put to good use. It can be made useful. Similarly, this shameless people can be made useful if they would but gather themselves. So you just take the natural implication for us. People in and of ourselves, worthless, apart from Christ, we have nothing to offer God, no real thing to offer the world that would bring God's glory, God glory and turn the world back toward its maker to glorify him and worship him, no good works to give, worthless people like us can be useful to the Lord if we would yet, but rightly order our lives in a systematic, intentional way, be purposeful about putting all of your resources, whatever you do have, to good use. Gather yourselves is the call. You need to get your life in order is the call. This is a call for a right person to possess a right person, an upright life useful to the Lord. One other thing before we move on from this word in all of the other contexts, you'll notice that the word, just the spacing of the word is just interesting, just making an observation. In Exodus, Numbers, and in 1 Kings, the, the word was repeated, but words apart. Here, the only time that is used in reference to people, and it's actually calling them to repent or get their lives in order, this is when the words occur in closest proximity. Not to stretch this too far, but I think that's interesting. And perhaps that what Zephaniah is actually indicating is that more than pursuing the fulfillment of your labor, like they did in Exodus, more than pursuing personal comfort in rebellion against God like the man in Numbers, and even more than pursuing a prolonging of your earthly life, more than all of those things, is being rightly ordered under God's authority to actually gather yourself so that you are rightly ordered under God's authority and you possess an upright person before him, that is the preeminent pursuit. And so he just says, gather, gather. The, the words are back to back in the Hebrew. Gather and gather yourselves is the idea. O nation without shame. So this really, the repetition of the word just communicates an urgency behind doing this. He's already said that the day is near, verse 14 in chapter 1, near and coming very quickly. And so if the day is near, then you can expect if I'm preaching a word of rescue from a day that's already close and getting closer quickly, you better hurry up. There is a matter of urgency behind this command. Also, to, to emphasize the urgency is the number of times that the word before is used in verse 2. Look at verse 2. When, it, when ought this gathering take place? Before the decree takes effect, effect, before the burning anger of Yahweh comes upon you, before the day of Yahweh's anger comes upon you. Okay, we, we get it. Hurry up. Hurry up. The day's coming. It's close. It's coming quickly. So hurry up. Before then, you must do this. Gather yourselves. Anyone who believes chapter one, 
that this is coming, who has an ear to hear this word of warning, this olive branch held out of hope is going to hurry up. He's going to heed the warning. He's going to sense the urgency and just ask yourself, do you feel that urgency? When it comes to the right ordering of your life to get your priorities in order, to let lesser things take their rightful place lower on the totem pole, do you feel that urgency from the Lord? These are God's words, right? Do you feel, man, I, I must get my life in order, stop spending so much time on social media, stop spending so much time reading the news about things that don't involve me and that I can't change, and actually think about what God has tasked me to do in life. Take those priorities and be about that business. This is an urgent matter. Even the comparison of the day of the Lord in verse 2 to chaff, the day passes like chaff. Uh, It sees its end like chaff. I mean, this is not a long period of time that's in view. Once it comes, it's going to be completed even in a hurry. And as we fast forwarded in a few different places to look at Revelation, 1 Thessalonians, Uh, Colossians 3 last week, um, those even reveal that this is not a long period of time. Revelation being the clearest of those, there's a seven-year period. There's a seven-year window when God is going to pour out his unrelenting wrath on the world in the ways described by John later, much later than Zephaniah. But there's a brief window when that comes. It passes like chaff, just like Uh, This almost weightless um, substance that falls from the head of grain just gets carried away with the wind. It's here, it's gone. As quickly as a gust of wind can carry that chaff off, that's how quick the day is passing once it comes. And so this certainly is, for all of those reasons, a matter of urgency. It's also a matter of embracing shame. We, we mentioned this already. O nation without shame. That's not a, a compliment. <laughs> you know, in our day, it's popular to just to not be ashamed of anything. I don't care what anybody else thinks. I'm a do me, you do you, you be you. Um, God accepts you the way you are. Those kinds of wrong thoughts. This is not a compliment. To be without shame is not a compliment. Thomas Watson helpfully says in the Doctrine of Repentance that uh, scarlet the, is the color of blushing. Uh, the sh- shame is the color of blushing that accompanies shame and blushing. They go hand in hand, if you will. Um, those who know genuine repentance also know shame. And just for one reference to this, just look at Romans chapter 6. Paul commends the Romans for this very virtue of knowing shame. Even as believers, when the Roman believers in chapter 6 think about their life before Christ, those things that they still have to fight against sin, putting off sin, How do they feel about those things? What's their disposition? It is one of shame. Look at Romans 6, verse 20. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. The things of which you are now ashamed. The Christian knows shame. And when you think of your past life as an unbeliever, the sins that you used to enjoy, you don't relish in those things now. You feel shame for them. Oh, God, I was such a fool. How wicked, how shameful. No one should ever speak of those things again, right? The language you used to use, the company you used to keep, the practices that you engaged in publicly and privately, 
And you just think about those things and go, thank you, Lord, that that is no longer me. I don't enjoy those things. Anybody who feels that sense of shame for godly reasons, that is an evidence of God's grace at work in you to make you rightly ashamed. Because one time you weren't, right? This nation, this command comes to a nation that presently did not feel shame as they ought to. Finally, this, this urgency, this, this matter of a, a right person is a matter of personal responsibility because the onus is put on the people. You, you could say, gather yourselves. You gather yourselves. This isn't anybody else's job to get your life in order, to make sure that you submit to the Lord from the heart, right? Smed just preached this morning, yes, we are our brother's keeper. We need to help each other. And at the end of the day, you know this like I do, if you have your heart set on sin, nobody else in the world is going to stop you. We can keep each other insofar as the one, the other one, right, the one another wants to be kept. So that works really well in the church where everybody's saying, hey, please keep me. Watch my life. You watch mine. I'll watch yours. And then we keep each other. <laughs> where the person doesn't want to be kept, they're going to sin. So the, the impetus, we all have a burden to bear. The impetus is put on each one of us to rightly order our lives under God's authority. You do the gathering, you do the gathering to yourselves. And then secondly, the, the, the distinguishing mark to highlight for the rest of this passage in verse three is right pursuits, right pursuits. The one who hears this word of dire warning about the wrath to come, this person can joyfully look, in, look at the future at this coming day who has right pursuits, who if you know from the heart you are pursuing the Lord, verse 3, you are pursuing righteousness, you are pursuing humility. There's this three commands given in this verse, seek Yahweh, seek righteousness, seek humility. Those are the things to be pursued. God himself, the righteousness that God produces, and the humility that God produces, and the righteousness and humility that he even grants. And you can't have those things apart from a work of God in your life. Talked about that this morning in Equipping Hour. God's grace on display in the life when men and women sincerely humble themselves before him and obey his command, put forth strenuous effort to submit to him. If these pursuits don't characterize you, then everything that Zephaniah has said about the day, all of the distress, all of the anguish, all of the wrath, all of the anger of God that's coming is for you. Men, women, children alike. So what are we to seek? Verse 3, seek Yahweh, all you humble of the earth who have carried out his ordinances. Seek righteousness, seek humility is the call. This is addressed to the humble of the earth. Now, just uh, two verses ago, who was addressed? It's a direct address in verse 1, this shameless nation. How is Zephaniah now addressing in the same breath another command, the next command, to a humble people. Has the change happened in verse 2, between 1 and 3? Not likely. I think what's happening here is that he is able to address this second half of the commands in verse 3, this second half of the, the hope that he's holding out, even though these are people in a shameless nation, the ones who will sincerely hear and obey are, in fact, the humble of the earth. 
the humble in the land. They're the men, women, and children who will, in fact, humble themselves and obey the words being, being heralded by the prophet. So does that describe you? Are you someone who desires and does seek the Lord, seek righteousness, seek humility? Then that means you are, in fact, humble. Anyone who does not seek the Lord, who does not seek righteousness, who does not seek humility, then is not humble. Obviously, you're not seeking humility. How could you possibly be humble? No, to not seek the Lord, and that word seek here three times, again, you get the, the, a repetition of words, just like before, 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 seek, 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 Yahweh, righteousness, and humility, before, 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 the day comes, is the idea. That word seek Implicit in it is a is a has a flavor of the, the desire. What you seek is what you want. You go after, you choose to pursue whatever it is you desire most. And that's the same for all of us. Whatever we prioritize in life is because that is where our desires lie. Where your treasure is, your heart will be also, Jesus said. So whatever you value most, that's where your heart's at. That's where your desires are. You think about it. You talk about it. You want it. You work for it. You make time for it. And so this seeking of the Lord, that indicates that the heart of the humble worshiper is with the Lord. I desire him. I desire God. I want him. I want to know him. I want to obey him. I want to glorify him. I want him to get the most out of me in this life that he possibly can. And I'm going to labor to exhaustion to make sure that happens by his grace, with his power. And it's all you humble of the earth, humble of the land, who have carried out or who do carry out, who do his ordinances is the idea. So again, this is just characteristic of the people in view. Those who are obeying these commands will be characterized by doing what he says is right. The the ordinances, what God calls just, what he calls righteous, the humble of the earth go do. And their lives are not, they never do that perfectly. None of us does. That goes without saying. If anyone says he's without sin, he's a liar. The truth is not in him. But they're characterized by this. Characteristically, their pattern of life, it's a habit for them to carry out God's ordinances. So can that be said of you? If somebody watched your life for a week and just observed you, observed you, went where you went, heard every conversation, got to see what you do in private, had access to the thoughts in your mind, yikes. Would they say, man, there's, there's a, lot, a lot of room to grow. But that person's thoughts, words, priorities, they are intent on pursuing the Lord, on going after what he says is right, on being low before him. Would, would, would your friends at school, students, be able to say that about you? Would your children, parents, be able to say that about you? Would your spouse, husbands and wives, say, they don't always get it right, they're a piece of work, but they are pursuing the Lord, absolutely. I hope so. The, the hope of this entire passage, the escape from the universal destruction of the day of the Lord, is really captured in one word or one phrase, perhaps. At the end of verse 3, perhaps. Perhaps you will be hidden. And here, the prophet whose name means 
Yahweh hides, Zephaniah, Yahweh hides, has this message where he says, you can be hidden. Perhaps God will hide you. Yahweh does hide, and maybe, just maybe, if you gather yourselves and if you seek Yahweh and if you seek righteousness and if you seek humility, Yahweh will hide you. What's going on with this perhaps? That makes it sound like, eh, maybe. There's a chance. Really, the, the word is, is a perfect word for this context. Uh, what it means is something may be, that something may be, but it occurs in context throughout the Old Testament as an expression of hope, request, or fear. Hope, request, or fear. And this is one of those instances where it's actually, obviously, I think, in a word of hope. All of this doom and gloom, disaster, destruction coming, and perhaps you may be hidden. This is, uh, occurs in some other context where hope is, is kind of implied. Uh, Sarah uses this when she sinfully tells Abraham uh, to go have children by Hagar. She says, perhaps I may have a son by her. She's hoping for a son, right? Also, Jacob trying to uh, propitiate Esau's wrath, so he sends gifts ahead of him when he has to encounter his brother that he hasn't seen since he took the blessing. And he says, perhaps he won't be mad at me. He won't be angry if he receives these gifts that I've sent. Uh, And then Moses in Exodus 32 When they sin with the golden calf, he says, perhaps I can go make this right with the Lord and atone for your sin. There's an air of hope in those words. This is similar. The hiding is an actual, literal um, putting away for safekeeping when the destruction of the day of the Lord comes. So you think of a, a tornado People run for cover to a low place so that the tornado passes by and then everything's safe and they can come out. That's what's happening. The day of the Lord's coming, he's going to hide the humble of the earth, the humble of the land. The day of the Lord will pass and then it will be safe and we'll enter into chapter three in joy and eternal bliss. That's the hiding, and it's in the day of Yahweh's anger. So what is this hiding? I mean, Zephaniah doesn't tell us. He just says the day of the Lord's coming, and there's hope you can be hidden, and we don't get any more details. It's not apparent even that Zephaniah had any more information than what had been revealed. Well, here we find ourselves some 2,600 years later, and we do have more revelation. What is the hiding from the day of the Lord when it comes? Flip over to 1 Thessalonians again. I think this is what is being anticipated, although not explicitly spelled out, is what we would call, from the New Testament perspective, the rapture, where the humble, the church, are actually rescued from the coming day of the Lord. So if you just look at 1 Thessalonians 1, and I'll try and tie this together for us quickly, Paul's message in Thessalonica when he came, Acts 17, verses 1 through 9, his message was, wrath is coming. Wrath is coming, and Jesus Christ rescues from the wrath to come. How do we know that was his message? Because he actually says when he writes back to the Thessalonians that that's what they learned to believe from him. Verse 9, 1 Thessalonians 1, For they themselves report about us what kind of of a reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven 
whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. The day of the Lord had not come yet. It's still coming nearer than when Zephaniah talked about it. So it's real close. You can be saved. Jesus, the Messiah, the one who died on the cross for sinners, absorbed the eternal wrath of God in hell for for every sinner who would believe in him. He also rescues from the coming wrath. And so this is what he said they believed. And they were waiting for the son to rescue them from that coming wrath. We find ourselves in the same place in human history, waiting for Jesus to rescue us from the wrath to come. How are you waiting? Are you seeking the Lord? Are you seeking righteousness? Are you seeking humility in your waiting? Flip over to chapter four. He gets explicit telling us how this particular rescue is coming. And he says in chapter 4, verse 13, to the Thessalonians, we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers. So I'm going to fill in some information about the resurrection that's coming. Specifically, those who are asleep is the information he's going to give them so that you will not grieve as those, as do the rest, who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by a word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So Paul gives the details that Zephaniah did not know, did not seem to have. How is the church going to escape? How are the humble of the earth going to escape this coming day of the Lord? Well, their Messiah and Savior and King, with whom they will one day dwell, will descend from heaven and snatch them away before the day of the Lord so that they will be hidden, safely preserved in heaven with their Messiah and King while he pours out wrath on the world. He even emphasizes again in verse 9 of chapter 5, God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Again, therefore, comfort one another and build one another up, just as you are also doing. So this is how this fits together. The rescue that's coming to God's people comes by way of Jesus snatching them away to be preserved in heaven with him. And so just ask yourself, do you live the kind of life that indicates that you will be rescued from the day of the Lord? You don't have to wonder whether or not you will be rescued. Live an upright life. Prioritize all that God calls you to. Rightly order your life under his authority so that you seek him, so that you don't live like a practical atheist in the here and now. And you can have the hope that Zephaniah holds out for even his audience that you will indeed be hidden in the day of Yahweh's anger. And as one who has received that grace to be hidden, to be transformed, renewed by God's Holy Spirit, now walking in newness of life, you should run into everybody else's life and tell them of this hope that you have. You too, sinner, 
can be rescued. I receive this grace. Wrath is still coming before the day of the Lord. Seek him. Will you repent? Believe in Jesus. Put off your own righteousness and hold to him. Will you do that? Let's pray. God, thank you for such hope, for such words. Even those of us who can see all of the remaining blemishes in our lives that still exist in our thought life, in our motivation, where we spend the time that you've given us at times so poorly. With all of that in view still, to have evidence of salvation is a marvelous thing. I pray for saints who who are here, who may hear this later, who may be weak and just struggling, faint-hearted perhaps, struggling with besetting sins. God, I pray that this word of hope given to us so long ago would be an encouragement to put off sin, to continue to strive for faithfulness, to not give up in the fight against remaining sins, that you would further purify us, uh, increase our conviction and sensitivity to remaining sin, and increase our holiness so that as the evidence of your grace at work in us increases, so will our joy and our confidence in this coming salvation. I even think of those uh, believers who have been a part of this church and have passed away. God, even thinking of one day uh, being rescued by you from the day of the Lord with them. Uh, what a glorious day that's coming. Help us to be zealous to proclaim this truth to anyone who will listen. And we pray that people in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in our workplaces, um, wherever we do business and, and go, that as we are ready, as you make us ready to articulate these truths, that you would bring those with ears to hear who are eager so that uh, we would articulate this truth, anticipating a receptive ear. And God, I pray that you would uh, use that method, the uh, only real method uh, to grow your church by bringing in disciples uh, by way of the gospel, that you would grow this church in that way and that we would all learn to grow up together until we are perfectly uh, conform to the image of Christ all together and unified by the truth. And we pray you would accomplish these things in us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.